as a writer and as a publisher, I would just want to say to her grandma, heart and soul, if you have a story to tell the little ones that come after you, just do it. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. As long as it comes from your heart, just do it. Get out of, get out of your way. Just let your heart speak to those little hearts and minds and souls that will live after you so that you will always live in them. And that puts your imprint on generations to come. Don't miss that opportunity. And don't try to market something to the world if it's going to hold you back. Just do it for, for the people in your family because you're a, you're a walking treasure. And, and one day we all, we won't be here anymore. And how wonderful to leave a legacy of love and sweetness behind. Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Boomer women. Are we wise women? Are we mavens? Are we crones? Hell yeah. And we're also still curious, fun-loving, interesting, the list goes on. This podcast is for you. My guests are folk who have a message for our demographic. And if you want to hear a specific message, let me know and I'll find the guests. This podcast is also a conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it. And we must perpetuate the art form. I try and let my guests have the greater say, and usually we fit in a good laugh or two. Listen in now to today's guest. Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. One of my favorite memories from when my children were small is curled up together so I could read a book with them from Little Golden Books through Charlotte's Web and Bumble McBean. When my grandson was small, he would ask for stories in the van. And unlike when my kids were small and we had an endless supply of uh, story cassettes, I remember them, um, I'd create a story as we drove. I thought a couple of them were pretty good, but I never did get around to committing them to paper. I love reading out loud so much, I did for a while think about a site or a podcast where children could listen to me read their favorite stories. My guest today knows all about children's literature. She actually has a lot of knowledge about the whole book journey. We've had a bit of a theme these last few weeks, haven't we? Today, Carrie is going to talk about children's literature, how to find the good stuff, and how to write the better stuff. (laughs) Carrie Pierce, welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. Oh, thank you, Agnes. It is a joy and a pleasure to be with you and your listeners today. And what a beautiful introduction. And as I listen to your incredible voice, I think maybe you should consider doing that and doing some audiobook reading for children. Your voice is so beautiful. Thank you for that. I actually was back in the day, a radio announcer wannabe. <laughs> well, it's never too late. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I've got too many other things going now. Carrie, you've written professionally for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that career and how you came to be focused on children's literature? Oh, you know, that's a lifetime journey. It's hard to condense all of that into one answer. I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a writer. And for for quite some time in my young life, it seemed like such an impossibility. I didn't know the first thing about it. But I knew it was what my soul was passionate about. And I didn't think it would ever happen. I wasn't surrounded by writers. But um, at a young age, I began to write poetry. And I began to just observe the world around me in a different way and um, try to find the poetry and the art in, in everyday life. I think that's what a writer's heart and soul does naturally. Um, And so as my life progressed, I began to write more. And then I started focusing on health and beauty articles. So I wrote thousands of health and beauty articles because my original career was actually as a film and television makeup artist. 
And then I became an esthetician or a skin specialist. And so it mattered to me helping men and women feel good about themselves. So I focused on writing health articles and beauty articles. And that began to open the door for me. My my writing became um, featured in magazines and publications. And then I began to get interviewed. And my heart just kind of gravitated more after years of doing that to um, desiring whimsy and desiring sometimes escape. I think as your audience knows, and we all know we're women of a certain age, as you move through the life process, there are some great difficult things that happen. And as life unfolds, sometimes we need a bit of an escape. And so writing to me became that. And um, the children's literature is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think there's an, an innocence in it that is so pure and precious. And um, I just I just love that world. So that's I don't know if I've really answered your question. It's kind of a convoluted way. But writing has always been a part of me, whether I got paid for it or not. And fortunately, now I have um, been blessed to find a way to make a living at it. Do you think it helped sort of develop your whole writing capabilities as well as having the passion? It sounds like you wrote in a couple of different uh, areas. So there was your health and beauty, like that sort of thing. Did it all contribute to what you're doing now? You know, I believe that it did. I I think now um, I'm almost uh, 60 and I, I have been feeling, looking back over my life, that even though there were areas at the time that made little to no sense to me as to why I was going through certain things or having certain challenges or or doing certain things in the work world, I'm at a place now, and I think that that is the beauty of our age range, where you all of a sudden reach a peak and you can look back over life and all of a sudden some of these little turns and twists in the valleys, they start to go, they, they make sense and you go, aha, so that's what that was. That's what that was about. And you can see how the path actually has meandered along all the way and it has brought you to where exactly where you need to be or or the process of healing so that you could become what you really need to become for the world. So absolutely, had I not written health and beauty articles for years and years and years, and there did come a point in time where I was so burned out on it, because you can only write about health and beauty so long, and I did it for 20 years. <laughs> and yes, there are innovations that come and those kind of things that you can talk about for a while, but you pretty much cover it after a while. But I think it really honed my writing skills. Um, it made me a tight writer. Um, and it made me, because of that, a, a marketable writer, whereas in my youth, I didn't have the discipline. And I wrote from stream of consciousness, which is actually rather hard to sell. And um, so I'm grateful for the disciplines I had to learn along the way. I'm happy that I'm, I'm where I am now so that I can use those in a more whimsical uh, realm, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, first of all, I love whimsy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's been a really big, I don't know, tangent of the mind, for lack of a better term, to explain to people that like, yeah, you know, all the good things and all the bad bits still brought you to where you are today, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. uh, at any point in time, if any one of us had taken a different turn or made a different choice, our life might not be what it is. And as long as we're okay right now, that, that works. So yeah, isn't that amazing? And, and it's so true. Um, you know, if you're not okay at this moment in time, then it's not the end. And so you're, you're still traversing to that place in time where it will become okay. And I, I think the beauty of life is, and especially midlife, we get to be works in progress. And I think in our youth, sometimes we're so full of um, frustration or rush. We're in a hurry to get someplace or to become something that we become short-tempered or we become impatient and we overlook a lot of the little drops of magic along the way that are there. 
and to to allow yourself and your life to truly be a work in progress and be okay with that is such a magical place and it's very difficult to get there i think we almost have to be pummeled into surrender before be, before it happens <laughs> by life <laughs> we have to just get to a point where we have to surrender but once we do there's just so much magic there that can then come flooding in and it's it's an astounding place in life and it's an astounding place to be as an evolving human i think i'm going to chuckle a little bit here because oftentimes when i'm talking to guests oh about two-thirds three quarters of the way into our conversation into the episode we go into left field but before we've even begun, we've just gone into left field. It sounds like we could have a, a whole hour conversation on this midlife and why and how and the beauty of it. So, but anyways, back to children's literature. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. I did take us <laughs> off into, into no. a rabbit hole somewhere. But. <laughs> I was there with you. I was in the same rabbit hole. When we talk children, what mm -hmm. age group are we talking? Well, for my books in particular, my first book, um, Abby Appletree, was was written for younger children. Um, all of my stories pertain to life lessons and overcoming, uh, be it overcoming fear or um, adversity or loss, struggles and hardship um, along the way. But it's presented always in a light-filled manner where there are lessons that they can learn without having to slog through the sausage making of, of the emotions of it all. But Abby Appletree is uh, six, ten, uh, six to eight or nine. Something about my writing that you should probably understand and your listeners as well. When it comes to children's literature, I'm different in that I write also for the, the grandparents or the parents having to read aloud. And so my books are, they contain large words and they are also written for the adults reading them. I usually write my stories to be technologically obsolete because I want young children to have to converse with their grandparents and say, "What is a what is a rotary phone, and what is the sound that it makes when you when you hang up that receiver, or or what is this thing?" And I, you know, I've never heard of that before. Do you know what that is? And so I don't write exactly to children. I write to children. But I also write for the grandparents and the parents because they should also enjoy very much the process of reading to their young ones. It shouldn't be a chore and it shouldn't be a, um, a, a story that they just want to hurry and get through so they can get back to, to watching their TV show or, or whatever it is that they want to do. I want it to be something that is a bonding and that is a very lovely shared experience between the generations. So... It's hard for me to answer that question. My Abby Appletree has been read successfully by eight-year-olds, and people have sent me videos of their grandchildren and children reading the, the words, and it always thrills my heart to see these youngsters reading these bigger words. Um, and Tommy Tomlinson is actually written on up to age 12. That is a chapter book that has 12 chapters and an epilogue, and it is almost 40,000 words. So I write sizable books and meaty stories for all age ranges, but it's based around the concepts and the themes that children need to hear or will resonate with. I think you've partially answered the next thing I was going to ask you, because your bio on Podmatch describes your Tommy Tomlinson book as a superbly written children's chapter book filled with wholesome adventures higher level vocabulary, we just explained that, that sparks conversation, 15 original and beautiful illustrations. And I was sort of going to ask how each of those pieces come together to, to create a great children's book. And I, I love your explanation of, you know, the bigger words, more, maybe more complex, but also older themes that I mean, I know what a rotary phone is, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the grandchildren might not. 
Well, I I feel that it is important um, that children enjoy the story. I, I want them to be looking forward to, oh, what's the next page or what's the next picture going to look like? What, what Oh, I can't wait for the next chapter to come. I can't wait for bedtime tomorrow night for the next chapter. But I also want the grandparents and the parents to be thinking the same thing. And I feel it is very important that there be a certain pleasing pacing in the, the writing, um, the presenting of how things unfold and the descriptions of the characters. I think it's very important to have them fleshed out and well-defined. Um, but I also feel it's very important to leave room and little imaginations and also older imaginations to to bring those characters to life their way. I don't like to over dictate what my characters really look like. I think it's important to leave some of the magic to the reader. And um, the artwork in Tommy Tomlinson is very special. A childhood friend of mine did the artwork. We actually went to school together and uh, her name is Lori Mock. And she did just a beautiful job her artwork has, in some cases in that particular book, over 100 layers um, into the, the pictures. She she spent a great deal of time and effort on the artwork, and I, I think it shows. And the artwork for Abby Appletree, I paid to have an artist do three original watercolors. So I, I just feel that from start to finish, when you are presenting a, a children's book especially, you have an opportunity to just present magic and mystery and a bit of escape and and sweetness while also putting some realism in there. It needs to be a beautifully wrapped package. And um, the wrapping, it, the words have a part to play in that as well. I pick my words very carefully. And each word that I pick is in my writing for a reason. Um, waiting and structure sentence, taking the reader where I want them to go with each each meaning of each word and each sentence. I think all of that is so important. Right now, I'm imagining everybody out there sort of going to the bookstore or whatever they wherever they buy online and going, "This has got to be better than reading that dreadful little book night <laughs> after night after night after night." I hope so. I hope they are. That would that would make my heart very happy. If that was the case. <laughs> no, I just mean that we, you know, I, I, I'm sure so many listeners have been in that position where the child wants the same short book read mm -hmm. over and over and over again, and we're just going like, "No, please." <laughs> Well, you know, I feel, Agnes, that is very important because story time, it's something that we must not let go away. I mean, that is a bonding moment between parents and their children or grandparents and their grandchildren. It is a sweet, precious time to share with little ones. And it is so important to me that that the adults leave that time feeling like they have succeeded in making very sweet memories that will last a lifetime, but that they're memories that they also enjoyed making. Uh, it just really matters to me. I want to continue on with books, but just sticking with the illustrations for a while, do, do you think that illustrations, for me, if it's a good illustration, you almost stop the story for a moment and, and look mm -hmm. at the picture and talk about the picture and things like that. Uh, graphic novels have become super big, especially amongst those preteens, early teens. What do you think of the graphic novels? I mean, the themes sometimes are a little questionable, but just as a, an art form. What do you think about that in terms of getting kids re reading it? Well, can, can you define, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Can you give me your definition of gra uh, graphic novel? From my age, <laughs> it's an extended story of comic book form, except it's in a proper book form. So not the comic book, the paper comic book that we yeah. used to read. Okay, so more storyboarded stories. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were talking about the same thing. I, I think to me, it is very important to keep children reading and, and young children, especially wanting to read. But I do feel 
we have we should we should be respectful and careful of of what we're asking them to read and that is a a thing that for me even if it's adult books readers are giving over time out of their lives to read the words that you have written and i feel that it is very important to be respectful of that time i have as a writer i have given time out of my life in in sometimes excruciating chunks <laughs> to sit alone every day and write stories and it can be a very isolating work and i think as a writer you have to struggle to find balance you have to go outside you have to occasionally see other human beings but you also have to spend quality time with your characters and that means large portions of your day or night or however you choose to write are spent isolated and alone. So I have given large chunks of my life to, to writing and creating writing. But the flip side of that is the reader is then giving in kind moments out of their life, in some cases, hours and days and weeks out of their life to read those words. I do feel content is important. I think it does need to be quality content. I, I I think healthy, there's a difference between wholesome and healthy. And I know there's a lot going on in, in the world of writing and, and presenting of stories now that that there are two sides on and it becomes con kind of, um, there's conflict and viewpoints. I, I feel healthful writing is always a good thing. If it gets children reading and reading for the right reasons. It has a, a purpose. I just prefer if I had to choose between, I don't even know what my analogy would be. I, I just, I want, I want it to be delicious and quality and nourishing and wholesome and not gourmet. That's a stuffy word, but I, I want it to be quality nutrition for minds, not not necessarily fast food that you grab at a gas station when you're zipping down the road. If that if that's an analogy I can use, I want children's minds and young adult minds and, and even older minds fed beautiful things because what we put in goes out and vice versa. And I know I'm getting off in another <laughs> rabbit hole, but I, I, I just, you, you referenced kind of questionable content and you know I, I there's reading and then there's reading does that make sense yeah no absolutely <laughs> I, I, I just sort of threw that in there because I don't think anybody can question the popularity of these graphic novels yeah I have picked them up I've looked at them personally I find them quite irritating because I mm -hmm. want the story I don't want to have to look at all these details and try to put together what's happening so I just that was just a little personal well question. but you bring up a really good point that I did not touch on and, and I think that's attention span and I think between that kind of presentation in literature and then all of the screen time that we, we as older people spend and then also the youths they're on their their appliances, huge amounts of time, we have a very short attention span anymore. And that does concern me a great deal. And I think that is another reason why I write the way that I write is I'm trying, I'm trying to bring some of that back. <laughs> and I don't, and it's not entirely up to me. I'm I'm not patting myself on the back. It's just that I myself find the greatly shortened attention spans that we have now um, cause for concern. And I, I do agree with you. I feel like your brain responds to a lot of graphics and a lot of images in one way, as opposed to how your brain responds, reading words and piecing words together and stringing them together and then formulating their meaning and, and the picture. So that to me is why I use the fast food analogy over a, a good wholesome meal. I am very concerned about what's happening to our attention spans and and I don't I don't really know what the future holds if it continues cuz I mean they're getting very short. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if I can uh, reassure you, there's at least one youth out there. My grandson is 13 now, and he just confessed to me two days ago that when his mother says you can read for half an hour before bed, and he gets into like Greek mythology and stuff like that. Oh. So it's really, really meaty stuff. He says, Grandma, I read for half an hour. He said, then I turn out my light. I put my headlamp on and go under the covers for another half an hour. <laughs> so that is he puts precious. a full hour into his uh, his heavy duty. Thing, I, so. You're so blessed. And that does give me a, a hope there. <laughs> I, you know, I remember that age. I read To Kill a Mockingbird and we lived in a small house when I was growing up. And my parents' room was was just right across the hall from mine. And, and they would go to sleep. And if I kept my light on, it would keep them up. And I would spend hours under the quilt with the flashlight because I could not quit reading that book. And I, I mean, it was just hours would go by and it would be like two o'clock in the morning by the time I, I would quit reading for the night. But I that's so wonderful. And I'm so glad that that you both are having that and that you can share that, that he can tell you that. That's a sweet, sweet thing to share. Uh, and I'm just wondering how many people are going. Yeah. Yeah. The flashlight under the covers. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> The other thing I wanted to ask was so many books anthropomorphize animals. Mm -hmm. Part of me worries. I mean, I know it's an easy way to sort of everybody loves a cuddly animal uh, and then get your message across. But I'm a little concerned that, you know, small children think, you know, bears are fun or, you know, wolves are are friendly and things like that. Uh, What's your take on that? Well, I myself have done that in both my children's books, and that's a good question because, yes, you don't want to go run up <laughs> into the wilderness and, and hug a bear because that probably wouldn't go too well. I, I think it always goes back to the parents and the grandparents to teach. That is their role as part of their responsibility, and you have to convey using characters that children can relate to the, the lessons that that you wish to put in your story. So I have I have talking animals and talking trees in Abbey Apple Tree. And there is a character in um, The Tale of Tommy Tomlinson's Tennis Shoes that is quite a very special critter that has a lot to say. And I think it is very important to remember not only as children, but as adults, you know, there's reality and then there's fantasy. And as long as you're maintaining a balance between the two, both have a purpose. I, I and, and I do feel that, you know, that gives a purpose, purple, uh, excuse me, a, a perfect opportunity for a grandparent to stop and say, you know, you don't really hug bears. And this, this is a story. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying that. But I, I think to live in a world where everything is from the adult perspective and to pass that off to children takes a lot of the magic out of their world. And so if we give them books where it's nothing but a bunch of talking human beings and talking adults, that doesn't leave them very much room for imagination. And so it it is important to find the balance between reality and fantasy. It is very important for parents and grandparents to accept the role of, of guiding and teaching their young ones. But I think we live in a world that is pretty much right now devoid of of passion and and joy and and I hate to say magic because I'm not talking magic magic but I'm talking about just the wonder and the whimsy that's very needed for children and I think to to put them in a world where that no longer exists and it's all adult does them a great disservice I do want to get into the actual writing of children's books in a, in a moment. The one question that came to me as I was sort of prepping notes, and everybody knows I come with notes, <laughs> is, you know, the week, well, a bunch of us, and I think even my children to a certain extent, grew up with the old Disney movies, the Disney stories, they were all turned into books. Some of those were so violent. I mean, I, I'm almost 70, and I still cry when Bambi's mom gets shot, you know? Mm-hmm. Um could you give us a quick opinion on that one? And then I promise to get into writing children's books. Oh, we have plenty of time. We've still got time for that. Well, that is an interesting question. I think it ties back to what we kind of just touched on to some degree. You know, if you look back throughout history, Grimm's 
fairy tales, um, you know, cultural fairy tales, they didn't candy coat stuff because a lot of, of life was life or death and um, also cultural um, components and, and history. They're passed down through the telling of stories around campfires. They don't candy coat stuff either. And, you know, when you you compare those things to what is rated as G and PG in today's movies. I mean, what's rated as G and PG in today's movies were R when we were growing up. Those were R ratings. So children are being hypersexualized. They are they are being fed a great deal of violence. They play video games that are enormously violent. And nobody seems to think anything about that. But now we're going back in time where we have people removing words from Roald Dahl's writings, which just hurt my heart. I mean, the man was a genius. And now we have people just changing his writing because they don't like words. That's scary. And but but go past the Disney and go back into the Grimm's fairy tales and, and the other fairy tales from the 1800s and the, the early 1900s. Those themes are part of life. And again, I think if you're if you're dealing with there's a fine line between overexposing children to violence and sexuality to, at a young age and underexposing them to the facts of life in terms of life can be hard and you can lose a parent, you can lose a pet, you can get bullied at school, you can, your, your sibling can get cancer. I mean, there are things in life that are hard and children need to be taught in a loving, respectful way that preserves the innocence of their age that sometimes life is hard. And I know what you mean. It makes me sad, too, when Feline died. My mom died a year and a half ago very unexpectedly, and and she was very like Feline. She was a, a, a beautiful soul and heart, and, and it's just crushed me. And the world has less color in it now because she's gone. But it, those things happen. So from a cultural perspective, sitting around the campfire – for hundreds of years, passing your culture and your history along, story and parable has always played a part in that and and preparing the next generation for what lies ahead. So I don't know if I really answered your question about that, but I mean, to, to skirt around it and just give children pablum is to do them a disservice, but then to demand that they be adult and hypersexualized and and the joy taken out of childhood too soon is also doing them a great disservice there's got to be balance there yeah yeah and it it's interesting as you were you know giving your your feelings about that i realized that oftentimes with the children especially when i'm there is to come upon a theme that is that is the real world. People die, people get sick, things happen. But more important, perhaps, is the discussion around that. Yes. Topic. Oh, yes, that yeah. is so yeah. true. And and that's what it's truly all about, Agnes. And you, and you just said that so beautifully. It took me five minutes to say what you just said in, in two seconds. But <laughs> that is what good children's literature should really be about, is the sharing and the bonding between the generations, but then the having those those talks. I mean, where where else will children learn those things? I mean, you can learn things at school, but you can only learn them a certain way from strangers a certain way. But when you you go into your fold where you are loved and nurtured and cherished by people you trust, and then they teach you from their experiences, that is in, in my way of thinking, a much more preferable way to learn because it, it keeps you whole and it helps you to bond with the generations that have come before you. And, and that is such a gift. And I think, too, that that conversation is necessary, even if you think it isn't necessary. And the reason I say that is um, I used to have my grandson when he was quite young. Now, his mother, and he lived with me for a while, but I stayed really involved even when they moved back to their city of origin. And I would have him for 
like some, from Sunday night to Friday night while mom was working. And on the drive, he was really tense. And he's just a little guy at this point in time. And finally, it came out in some story, children's story that he'd read or something. The parents had died in a car accident. Mm-hmm. So he and it, it was only at that point in time that I thought, like, why did I not think and have that conversation that, you know, that that's a, that's a story. You know, mm-hmm. we're very careful on the highway. We never exceed the speed limit. Like, just maybe embellish it a little bit more. But sometimes things are percolating in a child's brain that you don't have a clue about. Yes. And, uh, you know, so. That's true. But how lovely that that opportunity presented itself between the two of you and yes it is a shame that he had to to carry that alone for a while before it came to the fore but i i think that's how we develop i remember as a child feeling very concerned a, about things and and worrying about the safety of my family when i was away at school i think that's part of the developmental process and it's it's part of the human experience And again, I think good children's literature opens up the opportunity for that kind of sharing, that kind of discussion. Um, You know, you don't usually sit down at the dinner table with your child and go, well, let's talk about death today. I mean, you know, it just doesn't come up. Would you pass the potatoes? I mean, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. And so if you're sitting in a safe environment... And, you know, what comes to mind is the movie, I think it was from the 90s, where the opening of The Princess Bride, do you remember that movie? I remember the movie, I I won't remember. Well, it's it's where the the young boy is sick, and the grandfather comes with this old book from his time when he was young to share it with with the little boy. And the little boy just doesn't want to hear it because it's old and stupid. But then as the story starts to unfold, you can see the little boy really getting into it. So it's this sick day that is shared between a a little boy and his grandfather and this old story, this old book from the grandfather's childhood. And by the end of the movie, the little boy just doesn't want it to be over. And it's been a, a beautiful sharing between the two of them and a beautiful bonding. And I I feel like really well-written children's literature opens the opportunity for painful discussions or meaty discussions that wouldn't otherwise present themselves in the day-to-day life between an older generation and a a younger one. Okay, let's write a book. (laughs) We're grandmas. Uh, Well, Mm -hmm. I mean, me in the audience. And where do we start? Like, Like, do we start with things we know or do we try to go into sort of a little bit of the fantastical what would you suggest kind of a combination of both to be honest with you i think the the best place to start is um do you want this to be a book that you publish that just remains in your family for private family use or do you have a story that you wish to share with other families and other children so the process is different for each but I think um, everything needs to, needs to be run through the heart. Um, if it is something that you feel is a, an important lesson or, or something that is important to share with the child or children in your life or that you're interested in, it is important to believe in what you're writing. That works for adult writers as well. I feel it's virtually impossible to get writer's block as long as you're writing what you, you believe in. When you get into the danger zone with writing is when you are forcing something that you yourself do not resonate with. That's where writer's block comes from. As long as you're believing what you're writing and you feel it's important, pertinent from your heart, then it you, it should just flow. And then you can go back after you do your first draft and then you can, bend, you can begin the crafting process of writing, which is honing and and tailoring and pulling in and this letter is better over here and that word is is not as good as this one and that's where the art of writing comes in that first draft has to just come out of you without judgment you need to just pour it out onto the page get it out and then after it is out you go back and you begin the process of editing tightening honing and crafting Um, A lot of people that have stories to tell never get past writing the first draft because they're judging themselves every sentence and every letter along the way, and that's never going to be productive. So you need to define what your story is all about and what it actually means to you. 
and then you need to define this is going to stay in the family and I'm just going to publish it for the, the members of my family. Or I feel this story has promise and I'm going to play the game of publishing professionally. There's an awful lot to that game, a lot of cogs and wheels and cranks and that part of things. And it requires a lot of um, skill and patience and, and luck. One thing that occurred to me recently is the fact that uh, my generation, I, like I am probably the last person now who knows the the stories of like my grandparents and possibly even my grandparents because they were passed down verbally. Mm-hmm. And I sort of feel that I have a responsibility to get at least the fun ones or the interesting ones or the exciting ones down so that my grandchildren have some sort of insight into what came before. Mm-hmm. Is, is that a possible place to start? I mean, I know it starts out as just for the family, but maybe then once it's at least out, as you say, that first draft is out of your brain, you, you can tweak it or whatever to make it then a bit more commercially viable. Yes, I. it is so important to keep stories and family history alive. And, you know, going back to my mom's passing, we were so close throughout our lives and we knew everything about each other, or so I thought, and, until she was gone. And then I realized all those stories she used to tell me a thousand times that I thought I had memorized, all of a sudden there were pivotal details in that that I I wasn't sure that I remembered properly, and she wasn't there to ask anymore. And that's a, a horrible part of the grief process, where you're left all alone with what you thought you knew, and that person's not there anymore to help bring clarity. And so it, it becomes a, an even more painful thing. So if you have time and you have the ability to keep your family and ancestral stories going, I feel now more than ever it is so important. As you're writing them, if you think there's a a possibility that you want to pursue publishing and, and releasing your story out into the world, there does become a pivot point where it changes because the first part of your writing was more intimate because it was going to be read by people that knew you. So you didn't have to be that detailed or you didn't have to go into so much detail or or history about things. If you reach that fork in the road, though, where you decide, no, this is awfully good and I feel it's important and I want to release it out into the world, then that changes your game plan, which means it also changes your writing your presentation style, and your end result, if that makes sense. So you can start out one way, but if you're going to end up in the other direction, there will come a very important pivot point, and only you will know what that is and when. I suppose, too, it's a matter of, I have a page on one of my websites that's just, it's called Stories My Mother Told Me. And I have been writing down some of those stories. Now, fortunately, she had written down some of them as well. So that really helped me get the the facts straight. But it's that fine line, too, between the stories and the timeline of all your forebears, because nobody really wants to read that. And that's as boring as history was back in grade Mm -hmm. nine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's true. Well, in cases like that, you can consider, do I have a series here? Okay. And then, then if you have a very fascinating family history, an ancestral line, then maybe instead of trying to cram it all into one book, st- step back and look through your family lineage and think, you know, well, great, great, great uncle Herman was that way. He was quite a character. And, you know, he lived during this time. That was pretty fascinating. And maybe I should just start there and carry that through to his grandson or whatever and and then make a series um you know i think too too often we make the mistake of thinking of one thing as one book when actually you may have two or you may have three or you may have a whole series and um you know after you get the first one or two out there in the publishing world and it starts going then the likelihood of the rest of them being published becomes greater so that's one way to to get around that. But you are right. You don't want your writing to be just ancestrally dry. Like if you would go to an ancestry site or something like that, 
it does become very dry and boring. Um, unless your your people are just extremely fascinating people. And I, I know that families have many fascinating people in them, but to have one family have everyone be fascinating is kind of an anomaly. <laughs> you might want to look at that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, mind you, there then too, I guess you're getting into the fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can make that, uh, that person that lived in the attic for so many years into you know, this real character. Mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. dear just on a slightly different bent, could you sort of give some, and I realize so many things have changed and you've already touched on this in terms of, you know, what, you know, an eight-year-old might've read 30 years ago compared to what an eight-year-old is, is said today. But, you know, obviously with the, the really tiny people, maybe picture books mm -hmm. with just a few words are a good place to start. And then it gets into more. Is there any timeline that's sort of standardized in terms of you know by the time they're six they're helping you read or maybe six to eight they're helping you read a little bit and maybe you're alternating chapters or so. like I don't know is there and then obviously well, I think you know there always is in in different countries have different standards medically and psychologically and emotional and mental development and all of that but I I can't really speak to that because each each country has different standards, but I I think each child is different. And I, I do feel that we make a mistake sometimes by lumping children and, and even adults into groups where these statistics fit you and, and you're supposed to be at this rate now and you're not and what the what the heck's wrong with you and you know that kind of stuff. I think there's um every child develops differently. Their home dynamic is completely different from the next child's. Their diet is completely different from the next child's. Um, their relationships and interactions with friends and family are con completely different from the next child's. Uh, and all of that, their income is uh, family situation, financial situation is completely different from the next child. All of that factors into how a child develops and evolves. And I think the more that a child can be exposed to quality literature, or even like you mentioned, the picture books that are beautiful pictures that that they interact with and that they love and, and that pique their curiosity and their imagination, all of that is, is a feast to a little mind and a little heart and a little soul. And to have that interaction with their, their grown ones, their, whether it's parents or grandparents, all of that is so important in the development of a child. And so I, I, I kind of back away from lumping people into categories or groups or, or putting numbers on them, how they're supposed to be developmentally or emotionally. Our human experience is so individual. But I think, again, what I really want to impress uh, for your listeners is that bonding time over quality literature with your child or your grandchild is pivotal. And you are being presented with the opportunity to build memories that will live long after you're not here anymore. That little brain and that little heart will remember those times. And that that's just every bit as important as a good diet, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> a thought that came to mind when you said, you know, the story or the picture book is, once again, this may be a question that you don't have a clue about, but do you know if there's books out there where it's just this beautiful, complex scene across a page with no words, mm -hmm. and the child or the adult makes up their own story as you go? from the picture like looking at the picture what what's happening is, is that that's a wonderful me? concept you know the world is so full of of amazing things that we don't know about i'm sure there probably is something like that and what a wonderful thing and i uh, i if there's not you should do it <laughs> well i was just thinking maybe i should edit this piece out <laughs> keep the idea and run with I think it. you should because you know that's why when you look at uh, the enormous the enormous success of coloring books for adults that started 15 20 years ago guilty as it's, charged it's very much the same concept and i would think um if there's not that 
that there should be. So I, I just hope you will pursue that because I think you're sitting maybe on a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Publishing. Is it difficult? You said something about like publishing a children's book. Is that difficult? Well, I can't uh, remember what you said. It just struck me as like, oh, yikes. <laughs> it, it should be difficult. And, and I think it depends on if you're with a, a quality a publishing house or not. Um, if you're doing it just for yourself, no, it's not difficult at all because you put it together and you get one of those software programs and boom, bang, you've got a book. But if you're going to market professionally, there are certain standards that have to be in place. And in today's world of hybrid publishing, which Morgan Pierce Media and Publishing is, we're a hybrid publisher, um, you have to be careful because there are some shysters out there and there are a lot of, we are one of the only publishing houses that does not take the royalties or a portion of royalties. So our authors get all of their royalties. Um, they pay us the flat fees up front to publish, but we do nine different types of editing on the manuscript. We do the cover design. We, we do the registration for the Library of Congress. We purchase the ISBN number. We do um, all of the marketing and, you know, the publishing part is difficult. Um, there are standards. You have to you have to write well. Your writing has to be um, streamlined and, and the fat cut off of it as much as possible without losing the personality or the concept of the story. The flavor has to be in there. And of course, it's our job to help you with that if you're you're not skilled at doing it yourself. But then comes the really hard part after the book is published is the marketing of it, because there are some wonderful books out there that never go anywhere because people don't know how to market them once they get them printed. And that's what's nice about working with a hybrid publisher is we do publish on demand or print on demand. So our authors don't have to buy boxes and boxes and boxes of books and then store them in the garage until they get moldy and eaten by silverfish because they're not selling so um, it, it, there's just an awful lot that goes into it. And again, the way I say, when I say it needs, I hope it's difficult to be published, does that mean the standards are there? There are standards in place for quality literature. And if you're going through the time and expense to publish a book, please go to the time and expense emotionally and talent-wise and time-wise to make it a quality piece of writing. There's a lot of writing out there that gets rejected because it's just not ready. And it's important to, if you have to reject a manuscript, to do so in a loving way. And that's something else that I feel separates us from a lot of other publishers. If we have to turn down a manuscript, we don't just send you that crushing, soul-crushing letter, you know, that you, well, I'm sorry, we're not interested. <laughs> yeah, it ruins you for life. We, we critique what we've read of the manuscript and and we we take the time and the effort and the care to tell you how to make it better so that when you do submit it to another publisher, you stand a better chance. And um, a lot of publishing houses just don't do that. So again, I, I don't know if I'm answering your questions or if I'm going off on, on tangents <laughs> that are not useful to you, but the standards for quality literature need to be respected and, and held. As, as a standard bearer, I, I feel it's so important. And again, it boils down to why. The writer takes time out of their lives to create, and the reader takes time out of their lives to partake of the product. That is an exchange they will never get back. I will never get those hours back that I've spent writing. And the readers that have read my books will never get those hours back out of their lives either. And when they finish reading my books, I want them to be grateful that we shared time together, and I want them to think about my stories after they're through, and I, I want them to be glad that my stories are, are in them, you know, because they are. It's just like you mentioned the Disney movies that disturbed you because they were violent and the loss of Bambi's mother. You witnessed that, and it's been with you all of this time. Well, the things that little ones read or see or listen to or hear or are exposed to, they go into them and become part of them, and they're in there for the rest of their lives. Those things must be quality. They just must be. So that's that's my passionate soapbox 
statement. <laughs> and I'll leave the pregnant pause for that to sink in. <laughs> Well done, well done. <laughs> okay, now you said that marketing word. Mm -hmm. With a children's book, do you market to the children or do you market to the people with the credit cards? Well, I I kind of, when I market mine, I market to the child, but not in a flashy way where they they want the toy inside the cereal. So they'll eat the cereal that has no food value to get the toy. I think that's bad marketing. I market because I want the child to want to read about my characters and to want to read my story. But I really market to the grandparent or the parent that's going to have to sit with that child and help them with the words or read it to them. And yes, it's great that there are so, one of those two people own a credit card is a wonderful thing because otherwise, you know, what would where would we be? But when I go to write a story, I write a story that I feel would be of service and of help to the little one. And that's my only concern. And I mean, the, the bottom line is you're not ever really going to get rich, rich, rich writing children's books unless a miracle happens and one of them is turned into a movie. So you don't really sit down to write a child's book thinking, oh, I'm going to make a killing off of this one because you'd have to sell a cabillion of them. And the margins, quite frankly, just aren't there. And I, I, I put so much money into the artwork of my own on the tale of Tommy Tomlinson's tennis shoes and I knew before we launched it, I'll probably never break even on this book, but I don't care because the concept of the, the, there's a phrase in the tale of Tommy Tomlinson's tennis shoes that my mom told me when I was four years old and afraid, and it's grammatically incorrect. And it was done in a very loving time in my life from a very loving heart that cared about me. And the whole reason I wrote the tale of Tommy Tomlinson's tennis shoes was to share that phrase with little ones who may be afraid and to bring honor to my mom because she's not here anymore. So if it makes money, great. That's not at all why I wrote it. And I just wrote it because I don't want little ones to be afraid. Okay, I have popped you all over the globe today and I, I usually have a, a flow to my questions and I know I've just been grasping at all these subjects is there anything I haven't asked you that you think a grandma who wants to write a children's book should think about should know mm, that's a good question but I have to think for a moment that's all right As a writer and as a publisher, I would just want to say to her grandma, heart and soul, if you have a story to tell the little ones that come after you, just do it. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. As long as it comes from your heart, just do it. Get out of, get out of your way. Don't grade yourself. Just let your heart speak to those little hearts and minds and souls that will live after you so that you will always live in them. And that puts your imprint on generations to come. Don't miss that opportunity. And don't try to market something to the world if it's going to hold you back. Just do it for for the people in your family because you're a you're a walking treasure, and and one day we all we won't be here anymore. And how wonderful to leave a legacy of love and sweetness behind. So I, that's the best advice I could give to someone is just get out of your own way and and. From your heart, do it because life is short and we're finite. And when when we're living, we don't really realize that. And it 
comes and plows into us at times when we least expect it. And, and that goes, I think, that carries the theme through about what we've talked about today, dealing with real life lessons for young ones. That is the lesson we all need to learn. Life is short. And one day we will be gone. What, what will we leave behind for those little ones that come after us? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, you've told us something about Tommy Tomlinson. Tell us about your book, number one. Abby Appletree. Mm -hmm. Well, Abby Appletree is very special to me. And I wrote her in one night. My mind had been chewing for a long time on anxiety and fear. And I knew several adults. One had MS very horribly at the time, and she was in an institution, and she had tremendous fear. And nothing that they did would calm her. And so I just started thinking. I had anxiety at the time, too, in my life, a lot of things happening. And I was just ruminating on fear. And all of a sudden, on my walk through the forest one day, these characters started coming to me just fully formed their names and their interactions. And I knew something was happening in, in me. And I stayed up all night long and wrote Abby Appletree. And she's got, she's got an important lesson in her that is presented in a, in a way that children can resonate with. She's, it's been very heartwarming to see her be so well received um, I've gotten some rather amazing um, input from parents and grandparents, and people have sent me, as I said earlier at the start of the show, videos of their young ones reading from her. It just warms my heart tremendously. So Abby deals with fear and overcoming loss, and uh, the tale of Tommy Tomlinson's tennis shoes deals with some of that as well, and having to be resourceful. and. Um, how important family is. So those are really core themes um, to my books. And even though I touch on moments of loss or moments of regret or challenges that hit, hit us all in our day-to-day -day lives, I always try to deliver them in a loving, soft way with an upside where, where we can see the blessing in the challenge or the, or the struggle or the hardship, there's, it's always presented as with an upside. So those are my two children's books. I'm working on a third um, now, which will probably take me a year. It's a very detailed story. Most of my stories, with the exception of Abby, are long books because I'm writing for adults as well. And Abby is about, I just think she's around 50 pages, but large print. And Tommy, like I said at the beginning of the show, is 12 chapters in an epilogue. And uh, that's that's a pretty big-sized book for that age range. And the one that I'm working on now will probably end up being bigger than that. So <laughs> wish me luck. <laughs> what I'm thinking is on my bookshelf, I have a couple of children's books amidst all the adult books. I, there's a couple of books that I always keep. And if I should give one of them away appropriately, I immediately go out and buy it again so that I have it. And it sounds like your books would be the kind of books that you would have as an oh. adult and on your bookshelf. Whether you give it to an adult or to a child, it doesn't matter. But the story, what's inside the two covers is is precious. What a sweet thought. I would like to think that. I. I have um, been blessed to get some some very precious feedback that has touched my heart, um, and and I'm very grateful for it. I feel that way about the Velveteen Rabbit. I love the Velveteen Rabbit, and um, and I, I I feel like I'm at that point in my own personal life where my fuzzy nose has been rubbed off and loved off, and and I'm my, you know my stuffing's coming out and I'm coming apart at the seams, but I'm I'm being made real. And I think the loss of my mom, um, really, the the journey of that grief and loss, I think I'm more real now than I've ever been. And and being made real is a painful thing. 
but it's also the most important thing that can happen to us in a lifetime. And I think it's really what the journey is all about. So um, I I hope that Abby Appletree and the Tale of Tommy Tomlinson's Tennis Shoes will become those books that people keep on them on their shelves. That would would make me very happy. Where do we find your books? Well, um, you can purchase them, uh, of course, through Amazon. And we have ebook and the regular covers, but also through Morgan Pierce Media Publishing.com. And uh Morgan Pierce Media Publishing.com is actually the only place to get a personally autographed copy of the tale of Tommy Tomlinson's tennis shoes. So I have um autographed several copies. And they're only available through uh, Morgan Pierce Media Publishing dot com. So, but but otherwise, Amazon <laughs> and several other places too. It's just uh, you know wherever good quality books are sold, and it is a publish on demand. So that's a lovely thing. So that means we're not out there chopping down forests and and you know keeping them in my garage. Where it's you place your order for your book. And your book is personally printed for you and then shipped to you. So that's a lovely way to publish, I think. Yeah, yeah. So Morgan Pierce, Media and Publishing. That is your yeah. company. Well, the website is... The, yeah. the, uh, is sorry, I have another monitor it. over here. So I'm reading your front page. <laughs> Feel confident yeah, about is, your publishing journey. That's great. Yeah, it is Morgan Pierce, Media and Publishing. But for the, the finding us online, it has to be Morgan Pierce, Media Publishing.com. Right. So, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're on social. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm under author Carrie E. Pierce. And I have a, a Facebook page there. And um, actually, we just launched a little treasure hunt um, built around the autographed copies of The Tale of Tommy Tomlinson's Tennis Shoes. So there's a video um, that I just put up there yesterday about uh, uh, The Tale of Tommy Tomlinson's Tennis Shoes and the autographed copies. So <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. Okay. Um, I always put the website link into the show notes and then all of the links. So I'll link to your book. I'm sure it's on here somewhere. Yeah, our books, I see it. Um, so I'll link to that in on your page on our website. Oh, wonderful. So, Agnes, thank you so much. It's been a joy to be with you no, today. No, no, that's great. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening, or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow. Share this episode. I always say that, but there's a question I didn't ask, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, if, if somebody's just starting out on this children's author journey, you know, I just said share with a friend. It, should they collaborate or should they sort of get a bit of background authoring done before they collaborate on a children's book? Mm, that can be tough. I'd say, Agnes, it depends entirely on the relationship, because um, sometimes with art or collaborating on projects, there can become a power struggle, and then you end up with a ruined friendship. So I think if you're going to collaborate, if one does the writing and if the other one does, is an artist or whatever does the artwork, um, that might be a safer way to go. It, it depends entirely on the people involved. Um, but co-authoring is done all the time and, and it's, you know, and from a publishing standpoint, it's, it's not a big deal for us to work around that. Um, we put both of the author's names up or however many people involved and they get their own author page and, and that kind of thing for marketing and social media from us. But it really depends, um, like any partnership, you need to know, uh, temperament, of, of the people involved and the end result needs to be clearly defined and spelled out. And you need to make sure you don't deviate from that because that's where problems start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So share this episode because if you want to write a children's book, there's a really good chance. Some of your friends might be closet authors as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> Carrie Pierce. Thank you for being my guest today. Oh, it's been a joy, Agnes. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week.